you are in for an interesting ride. And this is Joanna Summerscales for the ET Newsroom, something a little bit different. Hi, folks. I wanted to give you another viewing of the interview I did with my uncle, Peter Lloyd Summerscales, about an adventure he had whilst he was in the Navy. This was in 1943, so 80 years ago this year, when he was effectively abandoned by the Navy. They totally forgot about him. Anyway, he was rescued. And that person who rescued him also is noted by the anniversary of the 22nd of November, 1963. And this is the 60th year anniversary. And that, of course, is JFK. So I thought it would be interesting to put this out again for everybody to hear. And for Robert Kennedy Jr., my uncle was rescued by your uncle. And this is to honour that fateful day, 22nd of November in 1963, and then the 80th anniversary of the rescue by that gentleman of my uncle, Peter Lloyd Summerscales. Enjoy. I wanted to share something with you a little bit different today. So this is not an ETN related segment. This is taken from my own uh, autobiography that I've just completed called Vignettes of a Life, which I've told in a series of short stories. One of the stories that I'm going to share here is about my uncle, Peter Lloyd Summerscales. He was also an author and wrote under the name Lloyd Peters. He was not the most successful or celebrated of authors, but it was a passion of his close to his heart. He was a great guy. And I took a little bit of footage of him before he died in 2013, which isn't exactly as I'd hoped it would be the information that I wanted him to impart. Part of his interesting story is that he had joined the Navy very young and had occasion to be rescued. I thought it was interesting to put this little segment together in honour of my uncle, Peter Lloyd Summerscales, and also in honour of JFK. So we're just about the end of June 2013, and I'm sitting here with my uncle. So we're going to have a little chat. Can you tell us your, the first book that you had published? Spanish Medallion. The Spanish Medallion. Do you know, I think I have a copy of that somewhere. What do you call those? Uh, paperback. Yes, a little paperback. And it cut it down by about 30,000. Oh my goodness yeah. me, that's terrible. And I know you've written some full length novels. Or They're all full length. When they take them, they can do what they want with them. And how many, how many novels have you written so far? No, 16. And how many have you had published? Seven or eight. Yeah. Are they all of a similar genre? Well, you could say the love stories, right. but they're right. not ordinary love stories. Uh, I think there's a little more to them. But the Old Michelle is a love story, but it's quite a long book, isn't it? The Spanish Medallion is when the Spaniards came to the Armada, so that's getting on. But the others are fairly I mean, that was published, I think, first 1978, I think. Can you give us some of the titles of the your other works? Yeah. A Higher Education. Lionhead Lodge, Four Steps to Heaven, Rainbow of Love, The Spanish Medallion, A Girl Called Chance, The Orma Shell, Rose on the Pillow, Lionhead Lodge. Now I know you had a, a very interesting earlier life and I'm just talking about your time in the Navy. Um, Second World War. I was born in 25. Fire watched in the church. That was when I was 15, 14 or 15. Where were you actually born? Halifax, yeah. Were you born at home? Yes, yeah. yes, home baby. And can you tell us something about your time in the Navy? D-Day. You were at D-Day? Yeah. What was that like? I was 18. You were 18 then? Greatest our mods the world's ever seen. We, we lost 10,000 that day. 19 when I went to Australia and the Philippines. And... I know there is a story that you've told us about you being rescued by JFK. Can you tell us that story? Yes, well, I took a message to the Americans on one of the islands and my captain forgot as I was taking the message. So the Americans brought me back. You would have been stranded. Yes, but anyway, they brought me back to the ship and they had no idea. I'd, they'd put me ashore. Really? Yeah. 
and have forgotten about it. Amazing. So you could have been never heard of or seen again had yeah. the Americans not turned up. He good was the American. Uh, I said well, I thanked him for taking me back. Yeah, most top people are gone though. He said I've had a good breakfast. Yes, was that that was the reason why he stopped by to pick you up. All right, yeah. So, I mean that's charming, isn't it? I mean, yeah. <laughs> so JFK was the man in charge of the boat. Well, I thought he looked like that. Yes, yes. He about that age. Was very pleasant, pleasanter than ours. Ours are still stuck in the nineteenth century. They put it over the side. They said we didn't anchor correctly in front of the Americans, so they put us over the side in a longboat, and we rode up and down in the hot sun. As a punishment, I take it. Yeah. For goodness sake. It's archaic, isn't and the it? The Americans thought it was a joke. How ridiculous. The great yeah. British Navy, hey? My uncle, Peter Lloyd Summerscales, used to joke that he was Yorkshire's most famous unknown author, having written and had published a few books to little or no acclaim. He'd turned his hand to writing later in life, likely a creative outlet and a counter to his work as a podiatrist. The subjects of these tomes often took on a romantic theme, some in historical settings, with my aunt quizzing him when she found the manuscript, asking how he knew some of the intimate things he'd written about. That caused a ripple of smiles around the inner circle of the family, and I'm not sure how he parried that query. And there were yet other stories that took on the form of a mystery, and one day I'll look out the work he gave me and publish some of the unpublished manuscripts that lie in the bottom of a filing cabinet in my study. He was a funny man with a genteel air, the taller and older brother by four years of my dad, and since his wife of almost 65 years had died, he'd visit my dad on a fairly regular basis staying over with my disabled sister, Simone. She lived at that time in a nice two-bedroom flat with carers who came in four times a day, and she was only five miles away from my dad. And thankfully, Uncle Peter managed that short journey without any difficulty, unlike his trip from Halifax to Nottinghamshire, where he lived. Occasionally, en route, Uncle Peter got lost, and when stopping off here and there to try and reorientate himself, he'd find kind people to help him, escorting him in his pride and joy, a black Mercedes W124, to a particular route he'd lost sight of. And his telling of those not infrequent tales always had us in a state of disbelief and laughter. The most incredible story being of his arriving eight hours later and having to be redirected twice on what should have been a two-hour trip. This was the beginning of dementia, as we were to find out later. Meanwhile, Simone adored seeing her uncle. We all did, and even the carers at lunch and tea time would make sure he had something to eat. He was one of those people you gravitated to, and coming from an age where manners were a part of life, his courteous demeanour elicited affection from all, as did his unbridled sense of humour. As a youngster, Uncle Peter had wanted to leave home as soon as he could and set his sights on joining the Navy. So, once he got himself to the signing up process, he lied about his age and in 1943, at the age of 17, found himself on a whole new path in life, right in the middle of the Second World War. However, it wasn't too long before he fell out of love with the Navy as his experience of it progressed. He cited arrogant, unpleasant captains with a cruel streak, who had his men doing ridiculous punishments for no good reason, like lowering a boat over the side and having the men row endlessly up and down beside the ship under a boiling hot sun. The incompetences ratcheted up for him, and when his time came to leave, he couldn't wait. He was disgusted with those of higher ranks and the way operations were carried out. It was during one of these operations, when they were in the Pacific, that he was sent alone to deliver a message to the Americans. The American contingent were based on an island, and so Uncle Peter was dropped off to execute his mission. And, having completed it, he not unreasonably expected his ship to return to pick him up. 
But it didn't. They had completely forgotten about him and he was stranded with no way to get back to his ship. When a team of Americans heard about his predicament, the decision was made to take the youngster back themselves, which is what they did. The group of 11 men were skippered by the recently promoted Lieutenant Junior Grade John F. Kennedy of the Motor Torpedo Boat Squadron 2, based in the Solomon Islands in the South Pacific in 1943. This was JFK's first combat command, PT-109, complete with a formidable array of torpedoes, heavy machine guns and depth charges. JFK was nine years older than my uncle, and in 1943, he himself was only 26 years old. He'd taken pity on the stranded teenager, and when they were almost at the ship, having let the dim-witted captain know they were bringing back one of their own... Uncle Peter asked JFK the reason for his being kind enough to return him. JFK smiled and said, I had a good breakfast, and with that delivered him back aboard. Of course, that was long before the idea of being president was even a twinkle in his eye, and it would be a mere 18 years later that JFK went on to become the youngest man to hold the office of president of the United States at the age of 43. So do you think you have many more books left to write? Well, I've, I've six, un, six un, unpublished. Like it's Amy, isn't it? But it's the story of a, of a girl's life from, from, say, 18 months to 21. Do you mind? I've had a wash today. <laughs> oh. Oh, come on, you. <laughs> you were telling me that they're in some libraries. They're in... Jack, get down. They've been in lots of libraries. Well, they've been in all, nearly all the libraries, I suppose. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Peter Lloyd Summerscales. And Lloyd being your dad's name, my it's granddad. Like second in my real name. Okay. Thank you very much, Uncle Peter. We've had a, a nice g and glass of red wine, tea, cake, sandwiches. Yeah. I think we've done quite well, talking. don't we? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Exhausted the dog. <laughs> it's a lovely dog, though. He's a good little chap. You used to teach swimming, but one of your main roles was as a physiotherapist with the physiotherapist, yeah, physiotherapist, yeah. yeah with the NHS. You swam Windermere. Yeah, across Windermere, three times. I'd be approaching sixty by then. You didn't go for a speed record, did you? No, it's seventy minutes first time, sixty the second, and thirty-nine the third. It's about a mile and a half, two miles. Have you swum anyway? <laughs> 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 A nose eye view, a nose view, a nose view. Well, thank you very much. There we go. We in this country, in this generation, are, by destiny rather than choice, the watchmen on the walls of world freedom. We ask, therefore, that we may be worthy of our power and responsibility, that we may exercise our strength with wisdom and restraint, and that we may achieve in our time and for all time the ancient vision of peace on earth, goodwill toward men. That must always be our goal and the righteousness of our cause, must always underlie our strength, for as was written long ago, except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. 
from President John F. Kennedy's undelivered remarks prepared for Trademark in Dallas, November 22, 1963.